Good morning, church. Praise and glory and honour to God for bringing us together into fellowship, opening our minds and hearts to the transcendent reality of God's glory, of His purpose in Christ. And so we come together every Sabbath to honour God in prayer, in song, in fellowship, in service, in love for one another. 2,000 years ago, as recorded in Matthew 16, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's a lot in that statement when you think about it in the context of where you and I are today, when we think about the last 2,000 years and what has happened in that period of time. The church, really, the word church means ecclesia, referring to called out ones. The Father calls us. He brings us to Christ and then we become part of Jesus' pastoral care. In other words, pastor means good shepherd or shepherd. And Jesus is our good shepherd. And he provides for us the care and the nurture. In fact, Jesus said those that the Father has given him, no one can snatch out of his hand. And when we refer to church, fellowship, worship, assembly, the visible church and the invisible church, we are talking about Jesus Christ's pastoral care. Very powerful and very encouraging. We are under his lordship, under his directorship, under his counsel and purpose. In fact, to use contemporary terms, Jesus chairs the church. He's the head of the church, his body. And we are part of that. The church is also known as the body of Christ. We reflect him. We are his hands and ears and eyes and heart and mouth in a witness to the world. Now, the Heavenly Father calls many people. Scripture says many are called, few are chosen. But of those few who receive Jesus, who believe in his name, we become part of Jesus' responsibility and pastoral care. And to understand the dynamics of the church, we need to go no further than Luke's record in the book of Acts. What does the church look like? How did it function after Jesus ascended to heaven? We can read the letters written by those early followers of Jesus when they wrote to the various churches, people who met in their homes in small assemblies right throughout the known world, as well as when we come to Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, when we read Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3, we see Jesus' message for the church, the churches of God in Asia Minor. That is where Turkey is today. And so you and I are part of the invisible church and the visible church as may be collectively organized. Why? Because we have received and believed in Jesus and recognize he's Lord of our lives. We hold on to his testimony. In fact, everything that we, you and I have to say is anchored into Jesus. We are faithful to the commandments of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, says Jesus, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And we experience that in the dynamic of community. This calling out collective in Christ, this one another relationship, so often spoken many places in Scripture, and so when you look at the collective of the church, you also see leadership. Pastors, meaning shepherds, you have elders, you have evangelists, you have teachers. These are all part of the dynamics of the body of Christ. We have different gifts, but the same spirit. And, and Jesus Christ allocates the Holy Spirit according to his will and his Father's divine purpose. So your gifting and your participation in the body of Christ may look different from mine. And our gifts that God has given us is not for our personal benefit, but it's for the benefit of the body of Christ. As collectively together we are about our Father's mission and vision and purpose of being a witness into this world. I hear very strongly on a personal level Jesus' words to Peter. In fact, probably Jesus' last words to Peter when he said to Peter, Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. And going through Peter's mind at that time would have been the reality of Jesus' earlier words, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And that was burned into Peter's psyche. And that became essential to his ministry. And so 
Peter at the end of his particular life gives a very powerful testimony that focuses on Jesus as the head of the church. In fact, just after Jesus ascended to, to heaven, we can see the formation of the early church. And Jesus is the Christocentric nature of Peter and Paul and John's orientation as structuring and forming the early church is evident. Peter says in Acts, in his famous sermon, Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. In other words, um, the Jewish leadership who were entrusted the very oracles of God rejected the Messiah and killed him, which this Jesus has become the cornerstone the foundational rock on which everything else is built. And then Peter says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In other words, Peter and John said, Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Christocentric orientation of the first century church is so evident and so strong. And when Peter was about to die, he sounds out, sounds out of his last epistle. Second Peter, um, chapter 2, verse 18, very last verse. He says, and you wonder, what would be your last words to the world? Peter's were, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Then he adds a couple more words. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. That's it, says Peter. His ministry, his mission is done. And now he waits the day of resurrection. So the last two year, 2,000 years, or what we know as the church age or the church era, unfortunately has seen a large-scale departure from the characteristic practices and teachings of that first century church, which unfortunately is labelled the primitive church. Within a few years, 200, 300, 400 years, the face of the known church throughout the world emerged quite different from the first century church. And this was as a result of anti-Semitism and political alliances and dalliances with the Roman authority. So you have pagan synchronism together with Christianity. And what we have is a very different church. In fact, you see that erosion even happening in the first century with Jesus' message to John, go and write and tell the seven churches. So it didn't take long for aberration to happen. You know, I'll give you an example. We, by way of tradition, by way of biblical precedent, worship and fellowship on the Saturday Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. It points us to creation and directs us to redemption. And... Jesus tells us that this day, this he's Lord of the Sabbath and that the Sabbath was made for man, within a few hundred years was appropriated, not to the Saturday Sabbath, but to another day of the week, being the first day of the week, Sunday. Not because of biblical precedence, but because of historical anti-Semitism. If you study the historical records, now you can look at other doctrines too and you can see adulterations and aberrations that have fashion the modern church today and we'll talk a little bit about that later and yet we see in revelation chapters 2 and 3 jesus message to the churches those churches are already started a departure from christ we have the loveless church in ephesus that lost their first love and jesus encourages them i want you to love with all your heart and mind and soul and strength you have Two churches that suffer from the teachings of the Nicolaitans, in other words, false doctrine, pagan doctrines. Now you would say, oh, that's not the church of God. I don't want a fellowship there. Well, according to Jesus, they were the church of God. Not all of them were tainted by the same aberration, but they had false doctrine. What about the Jezebel influence, the feminine influence for sexual sin, if I can use that language? That affected the first century church. It affects the broader Christian community today. In Laodicea, they were wealthy. And by parable, they said, we don't need anything. We're rich. We're comfortable. We're well off. And Jesus describes their church as wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. And then you even have a church that's dead. And Jesus says, wake up, church. Church. 
Wake up! It's a call for all of us, right across wherever we are. You'll find all those conditions in probably all the churches that you might want to attend. You won't find the perfect church because the moment you become a part of it, <laughs> we are the imperfect. Only the Lord Jesus and his Heavenly Father is perfect, but we are called to become perfect. And through the one another experience called church community, iron sharpens iron. We grow together in Christ and it's very powerful. You know, one of the most saddest parts of the Jesus' testimony to the seven churches in Revelation, he actually says to one church that if you don't repent, I will take away your lampstand. The lampstand refers to the, to the menorah symbol, the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit. When David sinned, first thing he prayed was, take not your spirit from me, I pray. And here's a church in first century experiencing aberrations and departure from God. Today, 2,000 years on, you and I are part of the Church of God's Seventh Day and we're in a unique position within the broader Christian community because not only does the world need what we have, but we humbly admit but through Christ that many parts of the body of Christ need the grace and the, the glory and the, and the distinctives that we've been given. Now, the Church of God Seventh Day was born out of the Millerite movement, which was a Sabbatarian movement in the 1880s. And their focus was an anticipation and an expectation for Jesus Christ's return. And the Church of God Seventh Day emerged out of that on the premise, on my Bible and my Bible alone. They had experienced an aberration that led them down a rabbit burrow of false doctrine. And so Gilbert Cramner said, no, no more prophets no more prophetesses, just my Bible and my Bible alone. And if you think about that, if you take that stance to build your life on the written testimony of God's Word with a clear, obviously, Christocentric focus, you will be able to use the Bible in all matters of practice and faith. And that determines the dynamics of doctrine, the nature and the energies of the church, and the outreach and the mission. Now, if you take the Bible and add to that tradition, you will see the context, especially if tradition is of the same weight as the biblical narrative, you will see much of the diverse, uh, denominational diversity that we witness today. Now, there's a third category. If you take the Bible and you take tradition and you take an elevated personality other than Jesus Christ, like a prophet, like a pope, like a prophetess, you begin to see a further aberration than from what Jesus Christ intended. And we have that evident across the, in the Christian world today. And so, you know, you could say the Bible and the Bible alone. But even then, we must be very, very careful that the Lord Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Jesus said to the religious leaders, you live by the scriptures. You seek those scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. And then Jesus says, but you refuse to come to me, that you may have life. So you can do Bible and Bible alone, and yet, like the Jewish religious leaders, miss out on the Lord, the Messiah. Very powerful. So I'm grateful to be a part of where we are today. Now, there's something about the, the Sabbatarian Churches of God that's very interesting. Somebody labelled us recently as the commuting church of God because we're prepared to travel significant distances to get together every Sabbath for worship. It's not like walking down to your shopping centre or the local church, which is a minute's walk or five minutes drive. I think Rebecca and I travel 40 minutes. There's others who travel longer just to be together on a Sabbath. Now, phenomenal Christians, if they go to church once or twice or several times a year, the convenience of having it in the corner store, the core local church in the, in the village, so to speak, next to the shopping centre and the, and, the, and the exercise gym is very con convenient because we've basically compartmentalised God as in a box and, and, and just, it, I'll go to church if it's convenient. And I found in my experience that people are, even though they agree with our... Church of God Seventh Day theological position, the Bible and the Bible alone and the Lordship of Jesus. And they go, yes, I agree. But, but the idea of traveling a little bit of extra distance 
just seems too onerous. Now, I would have thought that the love of the Lord with all your heart and mind and soul and strength would have been the energy and the springboard to God, I'll do everything. I'll swim the most raging sea. I'll climb the highest mountain just to be with you, Lord, to be with your people. But apparently that's not so. There is a lovelessness, a coldness, a... We have too much distraction in this life. And sometimes we just put God in a box. And it's tragic, you see. Um, It's terrible when you see faith as just another commodity. But that's the commercial world. And that's the way we're conditioned to think. There's another challenge also with non-committed Christians to community who enjoy what I would call smorgasbord Christianity, picking the best cherries off the top in different fellowships. And there's benefit from that because church life sometimes is messy, sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's challenging. So the smorgasbord Christian just picks what they want, the good things, rather than being willing to suffer with Christ and for Christ. And that's one of the things that emerged in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, You know, when you are part of a Christ-centered community of faith, you rejoice with those who rejoice and you mourn with those who mourn. Because you love one another. Jesus says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, you share the load in community. You contribute of the gifts that God has given you, not for your benefit, but for the benefit of others in a collective mission and vision that grants you collective strength. Because you and I want to be wherever the Lord is. Jesus said of church leadership, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. It's very powerful when you think about this faith dynamic. Because you and I desire to live and to walk in the truth. We desire to live by every commandment of God. You know, if you love me, says Jesus, keep my commandments. It's as simple as that. You know, we hold on to the faith and testimony of Jesus, and this molds and shapes us individually and as we gather together collectively. So the church has a twofold purpose and mission. I want to talk about the, the first one is evangelism, and the second one is edification. And they're vital to the health and the dynamic and the energy and the focus and the resources of the church. Evangelism is the call to make disciples, to witness to Jesus. The Father calls, and we are the hands and the eyes and the voice of Jesus in this world. And there's no negotiation. It's an imperative of Christ. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came to them and said after he was resurrected, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And based on that, he now says in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations and baptize them. He also goes, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. You know, our message essentially is from the Psalms, is taste and see that the Lord is good, God exists, that we are created in his image and likeness, that all centers on the Lord Jesus Christ and his role, with the Father, the Word of God, the sacrificial Lamb, the victorious Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah is prophesied, and that through Jesus Christ you have hope, meaning, purpose, and identity all in Jesus. Now the second part of the church dynamic is edification. It's not a word that's used very often, but it's the nurture and equipping of disciples to grow them in Jesus Christ. Now, edification takes time, it takes effort, it takes intentionality, it takes an active role of the Holy Spirit on a newly converted person, and it takes equipped and humble and godly pastors and teachers, and it takes encouragement, it takes years, day in and day out. Jesus spent three and a half years with his disciples before he ascended and left them, and I trust that We are no longer on the milk of the word. The elementary principles of Christ are so well embedded in us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks of his glory, of his purpose, of his word, of his truth, that we are truly all witnesses of Christ. 
So the pulpit, when we assemble, whether it's real or it's a timber platform or whatever it is, is a consecrated space for sanctified use. It's, it's, it's to speak only the oracles of God, prayerfully, humbly, no joking, no idle talk, no, no loose lips, just holiness, that Jesus could sign off on everything that we say and do. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, in his first letter, verse 10, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So the capacity for that to happen has to happen in community in order that everything may be everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Peter echoes what we read in the book of Revelation of the praise and the glory and the honor to Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, be blessing and power and glory to Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. And in this age, the church age, he's appointed and consecrated godly humble men to be pastors and teachers and elders. And they are really player coaches. It's a high calling to authentic stewardship and service of the body of Christ. And it requires every bit of strength and wisdom and humility and patience that only God can give. And within the dynamic of the church, we must never thwart or distract the momentum of what God is doing among us, as experienced in community, in house meetings, in formalized church services, as we are the kingdom of God in microcosm, as a visible entity, what God will do in every heart and mind across the world. And the reality is, there is a reality in this. 2,000 years ago, Jesus looked out and he made a a meta metaphoric parable when he looked at the harvest and he said to his disciples in Matthew 9, beginning in verse 37, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's a lot of people out there who yet to come to know Jesus on a deep personal level and be changed. There's a lot of work to be done, but the laborers, the shepherds, the pastors and elders are few. Therefore, pray earnestly privately and collectively to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. We need godly equipped faithful men to stand in that space here in Australia and I think right across the world. I believe it's true. This is an observation that Jesus made back then that none of us would disagree as being true today. How do we bring redress to this? to elevate it a Christ-centered proactive momentum as a vision for the faithful collective stewardship that God has given us. Well, here in Australia, we've taken a tentative step to formalize Emmaus equipping college Bible classes. It's just one initiative of many things that the body of Christ does, and it's part of the edification of the saints. It's equipping believers to become everything they possibly can be in Jesus. It's an Australian Church of God Seventh-day initiative and it's a huge commitment. But I believe that the fruits that will be born and the blessings and the dividends will be so much greater than anything that we've covered in the past. It's exciting as it is daunting. I think we need to travel in that direction because the Christian church, the body of Christ, built on the foundation block of Jesus, is facing existential threats that is probably has never faced before. I know Christ has always been persecuted. Christianity has been persecuted by the religious, by governments, and today by secularists and atheists, by education, media and politics. But we know in whom we stand. And being able to be trained and fully equipped in the right the word of God and to handle the word of God is, is not negotiable. You know, there's a beautiful song that's easy to sing on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground 
is sinking sand. Education is at the heart and core of the momentum and the direction and the equipping. Many times I see some small little boys, three, four, five, six years old, and I look at them and I pray and I say, may this young one become a pastor one day. May he become a leader in the body of Christ. May he become a faithful, godly husband, whatever the gifting and the calling of his life might be. Again, in the context of shared community in pernicious and dangerous times. Read the book of Revelation, how the beast power seeks and overcomes the saints. So we need godly men strong in Christ today and for tomorrow. And when we look at the type of persecution that happened in the first century, the disciples counted it as worthy and something to be glad about, joyful about, to be persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. You find encouragement and faith when people, when Peter was put into prison. The church community was praying for him. And I want to emphasize the strength of, albeit imperfect, community that Jesus can work with. It's very powerful to pray and to intercede for one another. To really engage with selfless, sacrificial devotion before God's presence. Knocking, seeking, asking. Why? Because we love one another. Very important to Jesus that we meet the needs for one another. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was in prison and hospital. You came to me. Very powerful, this caring for one another. Of course, we've been given various gifts. And that's utilized and exercised within the church community for the benefit of the whole church. And so our collective strength then enables us to be an effective and authentic witness to the world. A voice of Jesus through faithful, humble people. I want to talk a little bit about this risk factor of not existing in community, of smorgasbording without committing. It's so easy to do that, to avoid fellowship. Oh, they're a bunch of hypocrites. Oh, I'm tired of boring sermons. I'll stay at home. I'll read my Bible. I'll watch my favorite preacher on YouTube. You know, this creates a dangerous environment for self-righteous isolation away from what God can be doing and push us on the edge of the predatory zone to face the consequences. You know, when we take an isolationist viewpoint, we have a greater tendency to judge others unfairly because we judge them by our standards. We The risk of isolation mentality It creates an us-and-them environment. How can you pray for others? How can you care for others? How can you experience the one another that Christ ordained? And then there's Satan prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And if you look at the herds of zebra and gazelle and wildebeest in Africa, who does the lions pick off? The loner the one at the edge, the isolationist. And of course, you know, taking an isolationist position, a smorgasbord away from community restricts the capacity for us to, with grace to pray and intercede for the needs for others. And it takes away the opportunity to sacrificially serve and suffer with others and for others. Hebrews 10 addresses this issue. In verse 24, he says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Maybe it's a Bible time to do a Bible study to study how much in Scripture the one another of relationship counts. Our relationship with one another, as in the last six commandments, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father through the first four commandments, this one another, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, So even in the first century, you had the isolationist smorgasbord mentality. But encouraging one another. Again, one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Jesus is coming. And the saints will meet him in the air collectively. There's a lot of awada, one another scriptures that we could cite. 
So be grateful that you are part of the body of Christ and you find yourself as part of the Sabbatarian community and specifically the Church of God's Seventh Day because our obedient hearts will lead us to, directly to Jesus Christ. It's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle that you and I are here today worshipping and celebrating in this collective community of sacrifice, of petition, of intercession and care. In the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, he modelled what sacrificial community life looks like when he broke bread and blessed it and gave it to them, when he gave to them to drink from the cup of the covenant, and then he took up a towel and washed his disciples' feet and he commanded them to do likewise. Now, washing feet is not a practice we do today, it's, but it's highly symbolic of the willing to be the lowest servant to benefit and bless our brothers and sisters in Christ. What sacrifice looks like. See, in other words, live life with a towel over your arm, ready to wash one another's feet in community. You know, Jesus said, when we gather in community, one of the things we do is pray. You and I spend a lifetime of prayer privately. We close the door, we kneel before God, and we talk and fellowship in communion with our Heavenly Father, and we do so in the name of Jesus. We do so by faith. God who sees in secret rewards us openly. We understand that. And Jesus said, when we come together, my Father's house shall be a house of prayer. You remember Anna the prophetess from Scripture? Most of her life was spent in the temple fasting and praying. So prayer is not only the prerogative of men. It's the prerogative of men and women, old and young. Another role of our collective gathering on the Sabbath is scripture reading. There are plenty of examples, Old and New Testament, of the word being read out aloud in the audible hearing of others. It's a place for inspired speaking. The prophetic, thus says the Lord. This is what God says. And I pray that you have godly men in your lives and in your sphere of mentorship who speak only the oracles of God and no levity of words of their own. And it's a place for worship, to proclaim the worthiness of the Lamb. Take a hint out of Revelation. Take a hint out of Isaiah. The angelic hosts repeatedly praise God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Read it and allow the chorus of the closest that we get, I suppose, is Handel's Messiah. Alleluia, alleluia, he shall reign forever and ever. You know, when we sing and music is mathematically very powerful and can open up parts of our spiritual and emotional psyche to revelations of God deeper than we could ever imagine. When we join the myriads of angels in chorus and anthem, we participate in praise of God and of Lamb on the throne. We are given a glimpse. I want to read from Revelation as we begin to tie these loose thoughts up. Revelation chapter 5 has so many anthems of praise. John says in verse 11, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. I can't imagine what it's like for millions upon billions of angels singing, saying with a loud voice, and this is what they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Seven attributes of praise to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And verse 13 amplifies that. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea. Remember in the Psalms, it says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honour and glory and might forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, this is exultant praise that you and I have probably never been part of. I remember as a boy opening an old hymnal and singing some sort of hymn that left me flat emotionally and mentally. These are songs of praise and gladness and joy, and they're Christocentric. The Lamb who sits on the throne. 
May we value more than ever before, brothers and sisters, the work of Jesus Christ in building the church. May we cherish our Sabbath assembly, the best day of the week when we come together. And may we bring the best that God has given us and the gifts that he's given us. The God who sits on the throne, the lamb who's with him on that throne. And everything that we say and everything that we do and all that we are is for the glory of our Father in heaven. And may the remaining six days of the week to which our labours and distractions and busyness of life reflect the holiness and the sanctity of a redeemed life in Christ. Nothing less. May we be about our Father's business, just like Jesus was about his Father's business, and just like Jesus spoke in his Father's name, may everything that we do and everything that we say also be in our Heavenly Father's name. The Church of God, the Body of Christ, is the Kingdom of God lived in microcosm today. One day that microcosm will extend to every knee and every tongue who will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is King. He is Lord. And that great day of the Lord is coming. And today, you and I are privileged to share this dynamic, albeit small, the microcosm of the Kingdom of God, experience the community of church life with the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the church. I don't want to be anywhere else, and neither do you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, on behalf of the Church of God Seventh Day in Australia, I'm your brother, John. God bless you all.